I can start. Uh, so this, I'm, I'm going to specialize in dimension four. The, the previous result that I, w I raised, uh, uh, it was in any dimension. Uh, what we can do next, it's not a real classification. It's more like classification of the asymptotic geometry of the shrinker. Uh, it's not clear at this moment if that implies a real classification or, or how it implies a real classification. But it's still something interesting. So, so this will be in four dimension, uh, and this is joint. Everything is uh, so, so to save time and not write each each step. It's uh, everything is joint with uh, jumping one. So, uh, all the results from now on. Uh, so, uh, the f the first result I, I want to say is that. Uh, or, or maybe the idea, the philosophy, is that scalar curvature controls the asymptotic geometry. Of the, of the four-dimensional shrinker. So that's, uh, that's the idea. So it's complete, non-compact, four-dimension, shrinking rich is solid. And And uh, this is the claim. So at the base of, of this claim is the following uh, theorem, that if scalar curvature is bounded, then Riemann is also bounded, but actually it's even more. It's bounded by constant time scalar. So the constant itself may depend, or it does depend on, on the scalar bound from above. I'm not interested in that. What I'm interested in is when scalar goes to zero, Riemann goes to zero at the same rate. So that's because eventually we want to address the case when curvature is not positive. So, so that's the thick example. On the thick example, scalar goes to zero quadratically. This says Riemann has the same rate of convergence. So that's, uh, that's the theorem. I'm going to explain this. Uh, two years ago, I was here, and I talked about this result in much more detail. I'm not sure if, uh, if a, lo a lot of you were around. So I'm going to sketch. This was, I'm, I'm going to condense uh, probably two lectures into 20 minutes. So, uh, so I, I'm Ask just questions going, make it longer. Right. So just the idea itself. So just the idea because it, it's a lot of estimates and it's a bit technical, but just the idea. So it's a sketch. It's a sketch of the idea. Oh. Maybe I, I want to say this is really significant in the sense that you wouldn't have a situation of positive sectional curvature and negative section both going to infinite and have cancellation. So Correct. This avoids the kind of cancellation kind of thing, which is like Hamilton I V pinching three dimension. That there's no cancellation. Right. So so there's no surprise. Uh, basically. Well, but this is nice in the four dimension that you also right. does not, and that is uh, a bit surprising. <laughs> uh, so uh, the proof is it, it's really a four dimension. So how do I use the four dimension? We are going to look at the level set of the potential f. Uh, this is a 3D. It's smooth. Uh, well, not everywhere. For T large enough. So it's smooth. It's, it's uh, 3D. And it's compact. Because of uh, the way F grows. 
So I can use the Gauss equation. which relates the curvature of the level set. Maybe. So this is the Gauss, uh, the curve, oh, I need to put this up there. So, so the curvature of the level set, AB, is related to to the curvature of the ambient manifold. So this means KAB means the Riemann of EA, EB, EA, EB. And EA is a frame tangent to the, to the surf, to, to, to sigma. So the curvature is related and H is the second fundamental form. And it's, it's simply because it's a level set of the function, it's just, it's, it's given by this formula. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's related to Ricci, right? So, so this is how I relate the curvature of one of the level set in terms of the curvature of the, of the uh, manifold. But then the, the important, of course, a trivial but important observation is that sigma being 3D implies that the curvature is controlled by Ricci. Or determined by Ricci. So it's the Ricci curvature of sigma. It's determined if I know this one, then I can compute the curvature. That's, a, that's the important comment. So, then uh, that's good because I can hope that the curvature of the manifold is controlled by Ricci as well, right? Because that's true for, the, for sigma. And in fact, it's almost there. So if I trace in B, I get the curvature of the Ricci curvature, which again determines the sectional curvature as well. Is the right hand side gives me the Ricci curvature of the ambient manifold. There's something missing. It's the sectional curvature where you take uh, one normal direction. So N here is the normal. So it's the gradient of x. So sigma is, this is sigma, and the normal is the gradient of x. And so, so this is what I get by tracing KAB. Uh, I, I hope this is not confusing. This is not sigma of this sigma is summation of the B. So uh, I don't care much about this. This is controlled by Ricci. <coughs> this is Ricci, right? This determines K A sigma A B. Uh, that's because it's 3D. And on the other hand, by Gauss equations, this determines KAB. Right? So the Gauss. So so K, the curvature is determined by Ricci and, and this. So it looks like I can claim that curvature is determined by Ricci. How about this one? It's it's the curvature operator applied to the normal. So A 
is a notation for the tangent, for, for tangent vector. So this is the tangent vector. And, and n, or en, I should say n, to be consistent. n is notation for the normal. So if I can control this one, I'm in good shape, right? That's the idea. And turns out that this can be controlled, so it's, it's a good information. This is the gradient, so it's R, A, I, B, J. Uh, this is just, uh, it's trivial, right? Uh, I, I just replaced the gradient by, by uh, I mean the normal by, by this quantity. And it turns out that this expression is related to the gradient of, of Riemann. So uh, there's a new formula which I should say, I should write here. Uh, it's not new in the sense that we discovered it. It's a new formula because I didn't write it here yet. So R, I, J, K, L, F, L. So I trace Riemann in the gradient direction. It's related to the gradient of Ricci. So it's uh, something like this. Commuting the derivative of um, gradient of f. Yeah. Right. So, so uh, th this is the formula. So commuting, it has to be skew symmetric in ij, right? So, th so that's why you have two terms. And uh, it's the crucial thing is it depends only on Ricci, I mean, on the derivatives of Ricci. This is also by Bianchi identities. So this was known, new in the sense that it was not uh, mentioned here. I saved it for now. And uh, it, here it looks more complicated, right? It's not exactly that. But if I put absolute values, I can forget one of the gradients, right? So I can simplify one of them. So then I'll get gradient Ricci, but not over grad F squared, just over grad F. Right, because uh, I simplify one gradient with one gradient from here. So instead of getting square, I just have uh, gradient f. So uh, that's the idea. Uh, and and if you f if you follow this sketch. So if you follow the idea, you get the following estimate. The curvature operator is controlled by a constant times Ricci plus, so Ricci because uh, if you, again, according to this, K is con determined by K sigma, which is determined by Ricci sigma, which is determined by Ricci. So that's fine. The second fundamental form part actually magically cancels out. So, so I'm not going to detail that. It's not crucial. Uh, it's not a big point, but, but it does cancel out. It, in fact, there's no second fundamental form. The, oh, everything cancels out. The only part that doesn't cancel out is this one, which I... Uh, bounded by uh, and I can put uh, so I, I just replace the gradient as with with this with with root f uh, f is distance square over four right so so gradient is uh, kind of like root Uh, th this I actually I'm doing I'm, I'm writing very fast this is the part where I'm using scalar bounded so this is actually the only kind of place where you need scalar to be bounded wow well, you have two places one is gradient f uh, no critical point right yeah, yeah, yeah. so both well, uh, but that's that's 
set contained here, right? That uh, this grows like that, like this. Thing. So that's the crucial part where scalar being bounded is used, and you have this nice estimate. So now all I need to do is to bound Ricci by scalar. Right? So that's that's all. Uh, n gradient Ricci by scalar. Uh, that's the tricky one. So I think last time I did not spend too much time on this. I just explained this one. So today I'm going to say more about this one. It's uh, it's really important. So so that's that's the only part I need. So uh, this kind of does half of the job. It relates Riemann to Ricci. It's crucial because in, I, we, on that board we had three sets of equations for scalar, for Ricci, and for Riemann. I can just ignore the Riemann part. And, and work with Ricci and scalar. But if you think about, this is what you do in 3D Ricci flow. Right? You don't have Riemann because it's 3D. So I can do that kind of things, those kind of things in 4D because of this important formula. So uh, actually Hamilton has, uh, has computed the equations in 3D Ricci flow for the following quantity. Uh, so, so 3D flow, so he looked at Laplace minus dt of Ricci square over the scalar curvature to some power a, where in his work was a between, I guess, 0 and 2. And he observed that when a is between 0 and 1, some things happen. When a is between 1 and 2, you have, you have different kind of estimates. And and uh, this was crucial in his famous work in 3D, so his first paper about the Ricci flow. So inspired by that, let's compute, in our case, Laplace f, that would be the role of Laplace minus dt. So for the shrinker, you are going to compute Laplace f of Ricci squared over s to the a. So, so you're going to compute something like this. And why do you divide by that? Of course, for, for, uh, uh, for us, it, the, the important reason is I need to bound Ricci by scalar, right? So, so of course, I'm going to divide them. Uh, and Ricci has an equation, right? It's, uh, this is just uh, Cato inequality. Uh, so it, it, it follows from, from the equation that was just described. So we had some equation for Ricci, which involved Riemann. Now, now that becomes exactly this. I can just ignore this one. It's non-negative. Non and I can use that inequality from there, right? So I get Ricci cube. And gradient reach over root f, reach squared. Right? So I'm just replacing, based on that estimate, I'm replacing Riemann in this way. Uh, then I use Cauchy Schwartz for this guy. So I'll just be, I'll, I'll just have a gradient reach squared, and then. I guess a cubic Ricci and also a fourth Ricci. There is no reason this will work, right? Uh, I, I seem to get uh, a, a huge power of Ricci. And uh, if Ricci grows very fast, then I'm in trouble because I subtract a lot. Then when you compute 
Laplace of the scalar curvature uh, may be to minus a, right? So, because uh, I, I need to divide them, right? So this is the same thing as Ricci square S minus A. So I get something like this, which uh, so Laplace f of scalar is scalar and then plus 2 a Ricci squared. I'm using the equations which were erased but what you have can. So and then the same thing. So, uh, to save time, let me just say it in words, what happens. Well, when I combine the two, I have this guy, which is good. I have this two, which are bad. But, on the other hand, this gets multiplied, multiplied with Ricci square, right? So, so it's a product. So, so this whole thing, when I do Ricci square times Right? I, I have to do with Ricci square times that. Then I get Ricci to the fourth, which in, will be stronger than this guy because that one is divided by f. This one is not. So it will absorb it, and although it's bad, it's a negative term and it's, it's huge, it's absorbed into this one. So you need the scale curvature law of we do need the scalar curvature lower bound. That's correct. So, so, so uh, that's already too much detail. But, but it's not trivial. It's not trivial. And then there's another issue that what about when you take a product, Laplace of a product, right? Uh, this guy times this guy. There's some mixed terms. The gradient of this times gradient of this. What do you do with that? Uh, Hamilton has a, a two separate estimates. When A is less than 1, less or, or equal than 1, you can just use Cauchy-Schwarz and absorb the cross term into, into this one and into this one. So magically you can work it out. Uh, and when A is between 1 and 2, it still works out but with more work. So he has this kind of uh, uh, tricks that you can use. So, so those work out exactly like in his, not exactly because you're losing something from, from so everything is very tight. You're losing something here because of this guy. But eventually it works. Uh, there are a lot of estimates and it works. So uh, this, again, this is the main idea. And that's how you can prove that reach is bounded by, uh, by scalar. Uh, so maybe I'll just say uh, uh, maybe I'll just say this leads to Ricci bounded by constant scale. So that's f fine. That's fine. Uh, with the main estimate, so the one here on the top, I still need to do the gradient reach, right? Actually, we're lucky enough that we don't need to do exactly gradient Ricci by scalar. We need gradient Ricci by root of scalar because I divide by 1 over root f. So the lower bound I explained in the beginning says that scalar is bounded not just positive, but actually has a positive lower bound of this type. So looking there on the top, of that board, you see that this is good enough. And that will imply Riemann bounded by scalar. So this is the estimate I need. And so, so this is probably the point where uh, I, I guess I want to explain more. It's related to later stuff, so I'll just uh, 
say a bit more about this. So, uh, how does it work? I'm not going to prove it for Ricci. I'm going to prove this estimate. So, so there's no uh, sorry gradient. There's no uh, advantage of doing just Ricci. Uh, I'm going to do everything uh, Riemann uh, from uh, from the beginning. So for that you need to say well, what's the equation for Riemann. So Laplace f of gradient Riemann. Uh, so for Riemann it was Riemann. This was true for Riemann, right? It was just Riemann star Riemann. Of course, you expect this to be true as well. But it's actually not only that. It's three halves. So you, you're gaining something because you're using commutation formulas. And so this, this, this thing you're gaining is because of commutation formulas. You have to commute the Laplacian with a gradient. And you, you get from, from Ricci identities, you get something extra. Uh, so then, compute exactly the same as before. Uh, that's the trick we mentioned there, right? Uh, th of course, uh, this kind of computations go back to Xi, who proved derivative estimates for curvature. Uh, but we, we do it in a different way here. So it's a kind of different type of estimate. He proved supremum of gradient Riemann bounded by supremum of scalar, or supremum of Riemann. We're doing it point-wise, so it's a kind of a trickier thing to do. Then you compute this. Uh, well, you get this guy, you get some other things, and eventually, let's see if, we, if this makes sense, you get You get this. So you get such an estimate. Where does the two come from? It's a three from here. It, it's square, right? So then the two goes away. It's a three and minus a one from here, uh, from from the scalar. So three minus one is two, and that's what you get. So the point I'm I'm trying to make is that. How do you get a pointwise estimate from here? And uh, this is uh, quite interesting. So, so you have such an equation. I want to use maximum principle to get that this is bounded. OK? So it's, it's very different from this one, actually. Uh, so, so, so this this kind of work is you you get something else. You you get Ricci square, and on the right side you get Ricci four. Those of you familiar with the gradient estimate of Yao, that kind of things, you have Laplace of a function bounded by the function square. That's what you do in the gradient estimate, like for harmonic functions. Those you can use cutoff as cutoff functions, and you can get pointwise estimate from there. This estimate is different. It's not square. So I, I couldn't get fourth here. There's no way you can get fourth. Where does the fourth come from? Right? It's, you can't get fourth power four. You can at most get that. However, how do you use it to get a gradient, I mean, to get a pointwise estimate from there? So that's the part which I'd like to explain in the next few minutes. And I think it's a very useful point of view. So, so in general, suppose we have so general fact, which I'm going to use later as well. So suppose we have an equation which looks like this. So for W, a smooth function. Now uh, this is not everywhere. So this is on a manifold minus a ball. 
Uh, if you have it everywhere, then uh, it's, it's uh, very easy. But it's just outside the ball, you have an estimate like this. Uh, this is more or less what you have here. Of course, you might be worried about this term, but let's ignore that for now. So I have a function, and the Laplacian is greater than the function itself. How do we get pointwise estimate from here? So, so it's not square. That's why I, I mentioned that in Yao or Cheng Yao estimates, you use a cutoff function, but, but you do have square. This one doesn't have square. Can we get the function to be bounded? And the result is yes, but not really. Uh, so it's actually either W grows at least exponentially, or indeed W is bounded. So either it grows exponentially or it's bounded. And this is sharp. So actually, it is a sharp result in some sense. It's uh, If you check for this function, this is faster than exponential. So maybe here, you, this is not really sharp in that sense. You can get r squared, or maybe we didn't work hard enough. But, but it is sharp in the sense that you need some condition. If it grows too fast, you can check that this is greater than some constant. So there are functions which grow very fast. and. Uh, they do satisfy such an equation or such an inequality. But if, if it's basically, if it's not growing fast enough like this, then it must be bounded. So this is uh, the result. OK? So uh, I'm not going to present the proof of this. Uh, there's not enough time. But I'm going to say what motivates the proof. So, so why expect such a result? Uh, so, what I, the way I'd like to think of this is uh, I, I'd like to transform the equation into a parabolic equation. So, so let's not think of it as an elliptic equation. Let's try to do it to, to think of it as a parabolic equation. So, so let's take the gradient flow of the of, of this vector field. Right. Uh, why power two? Uh, it's because if I do d f over d t, that's one. So it means uh, phi takes a level set. So, so say initially it's on sigma of t naught. Right. So so I, I flow a fixed level set t naught. So it takes a fixed level set to another level set of the function. So it just takes level sets into each other. Right? So let's just uh, look at this phi. So this is just a philosophy. It's not the real proof. It's, it's just a philosophy why you, you expect to work. And the proof is completely different. But, but I, I'd rather explain this in, in some technical detail. So phi takes that. And then uh, if I do d omega over dt, that's grad f grad omega over well, over grad f squared, but that's kind of t. Right? So, so that's what we agreed that f is like gradient f squared. Scalar is bounded, right? So, so that's uh, negligible. And this was equal to t, right? Uh, f, uh, f is like t. So, so then I can replace. the gradient part with t times omega t. Right? So then the Laplacian 
part becomes Laplace minus d of dt of omega is greater than omega, right? So that's what it becomes. It's a, I think of it as a parabolic equation, and this is what it becomes. Now let's formally ignore that this is the Laplacian on the manifold and, and think of it as the Laplacian of the level set. So I formally replace Laplace by the level set one. So if we formally replace that, then things are perfect. I get this one. Again, I formally replace. I'm not allowed to do it, but uh, this is just heuristic. So, so let's just uh, pretend we don't have Laplace. We have Laplace sigma. This is what we get. At maximum point. This is negative because it's a maximum on the right. It's a maximum principle, a parabolic maximum principle. This becomes negative. This, uh, if the maximum is achieved uh, in the beginning at time t naught, then I'm good. I, I use maximum principle, so omega is bounded. So if the maximum is at the initial time, I'm good. If the maximum is any other time, this will be uh, a maximum point. This must be increasing, so this will be negative. This is negative, so I get omega is. Uh, bounded. It's not just zero because again the maximum could happen at initial time at t naught. So if it doesn't happen there then even w is zero but if it happens uh, then we get c. So this would account for this part when you can get w being bounded this way. Uh, so how about the other? How come we have the other scenario? So that other situation occurs where because Laplace and Laplace sigma may be completely different. So these two are not the same thing. What is the difference between them? So actually, if, uh, this is a standard formula. And I'll explain what it means. So th there are two extra terms. This is the Laplacian on the level set. This means the Hessian of omega of the normal direction. Uh, omega n means the gradient with the normal. And H means mean curvature. So that's a standard formula how to relate the Laplacian of a function to the surface Laplacian, and then you get extra terms. So what, what's the problem? What am I worried about? My worry is that if these guys are too big, that will balance the omega. Right? It will kill off the omega. If those terms are, too, if those terms are small, I can in, I, I can include them into a one-half omega and still apply the same idea. If they're too big, if they grow too fast, then although this says something is strictly bigger than omega, in reality may not be anything like that because these terms are so big, it might be a completely different formula, right? This could be, say, growing like twice omega. If they grow like twice omega, then this it just doesn't work anymore, right? So we need them to 
to be well behaved. And that's where the condition comes from that if, if it doesn't grow too fast, then those terms are well behaved and, and you can use the kind of the parabolic maximum principle. Okay, so, so during the workshop we will use, I mean uh, the, in my lecture I will use the, this philosophy to, to get some other results and, and it's very useful, it's very basic, right? You just try to use it as a parabolic equation but, but it's very useful at least to explain some, some results. The proof of this actually is just the maximum principle with a cutoff but you choose the cutoff very carefully and you're very careful in the estimate uh, and uh, eventually it works. And you use the fact that the function is like distance square, all these properties. For example, this would never work for expanding solitons, if you want to know, or, or for steady solitons. It only works for shrinkers. Uh, okay. So, so that's, uh, that's how you can argue, and that's how you can prove this from here you can prove the bound. Of course, you do have something extra here. But in the, in the course of the proof, you will say, if this is very small, if it's like one or even smaller, then I can use that idea. If it's too big, then I'm not worried about, because if this is big, then, then this is big. So, so when I divide, there's no issue, right? It's, it's something that's controllable. So I'm worried about when s goes to 0, does Riemann or a gradient Riemann match the decay, and, and they do. Uh, in fact, you see there's some wiggle room. You can decrease this too. You can make it one or one half or something close to zero. So in fact, it's not proving just this. It's, you can prove even better than that. So uh, that will be my next comment. But, but before I say that, this part, uh, this is just a very rough sketch. And it does complete the proof of Riemann bounded by constant scalar. So this part plus this part implies Riemann bounded by constant scale. But okay, I, I guess I can use it. I can erase. But it does, in fact, prove much more. Uh, with the same kind of argument, you get higher order derivatives. There's some constant, and here you get uh, this power, which is sharp. It's the same proof. Uh, again, you're, this time you're fully exploiting the fact that you get some good coefficient here. So uh, what's the k for, for k equals 1? This would be 3 over 2. So if you do squares, this would be 3 here. Uh, so, so basically, 3 minus 3 will be 0. So it's, uh, it's kind of the most you can squeeze out of this. And it's sharp in the sense that if you look at the thick example, it's exactly achieved by that. It's, uh, Riemann is quadratic, then the derivative is cubic, then the second derivative is fourth order, and so on. And it's exactly this, right? So you get all the derivatives, uh, they, they match the decay order. Uh, of course, this is something that on the thick or on a, if you know the soliton is conical, this can be immediately obtained from the usual sheet derivative estimates. But the point is, we're not assuming it's conical. We're not assuming any decay. We're, we're trying to get there. So, so we're trying to use this to, to prove that it's, to prove a classification eventually. So we, we do not assume any behavior at infinity. So some sequences, the scalar could be decaying very fast, and some other direction could be bounded. I, irrespective of that, we have this estimate, right? So that's, uh, that's the importance. So finally, uh, for the last five minutes, I'll, uh, I will present the application of this, and, and I will detail this more on uh, the lecture tomorrow.
So uh, towards classification of non-compact for the shingles. So this estimates actually allow us to prove the following results and kind of formulate the plan to classify the non-compact 4D shingles. So the following results are true. Uh, if the scalar curvature goes to zero at infinity, then the manifold is asymptotically conical. Uh, just like in the thick example, it, the curvature decays very fast to zero, and the manifold is asymptotic geometrically to a cone. The, the cone is very well behaved. You, it's basically the cone is uh, unique for any sequence you take towards infinity. Uh, it's the section of the cone is a level set of the potential, so it's, it's, geomet it's geometry is determined by by that of the manifold. So it's no no uh, surprise, no no unusual stuff going on. If the scalar curvature is bounded by a passive constant on M, then the manifold is asymptotic to a, to a, to a cylinder. So this means here that the manifold looks like in the thick example, it's asymptotic to a cone. Here it means that the manifold at infinity, it must be asymptotic to a cylinder. Uh, of course, anything can happen inside, but at infinity, it's asymptotic to a cylinder. Uh, there are two cylinders. Could be R2 cross S2 or R cross S3. So two possible cylinders, OK? So uh, I guess there's not enough time today, but when I start tomorrow, I'll explain mathematical what this means, and I'll very briefly explain uh, how this is proved. It's based on those estimates. Uh, then the plan is also in the next lecture, uh, why do I say towards a classification? Maybe you don't see any classification. It's just saying how the geometry at infinity looks like. But I will explain tomorrow that there's a result by Kochuar and Wang in mm -hmm. this case which says that if you can find that cone, so if you can pin down the cone, then that determines the solid. So basically, it's a uniqueness statement saying if you can find a cone, then you found your solid. That's why it's towards classification. We only need to know now, I mean, that's a big question, but we need to know which cones may arise in, in the limit. Uh, this is more, this program, let's say, is more along the lines of Perelman in 3D. That's how he proved his result. So it's not maximum principle like I explained in the first lecture. It's this kind of strategy. You know how it looks like at infinity. Try to prove uniqueness based on that. So, so it's not something, uh, it's not a new plan. It's something that has been success, uh, successful in some situations, but we want to implement here. Even this one, uh, there's some work by, by Lu Wang in, in for, for Minkerger flow where she can deal with this situation. Again, uniqueness of the cylinder. For Ricci flow, probably it's also true. So, so that's why it's towards the classification because this would be the first step. In the three dimensions, there's no cone. So <laughs> uh, it's only the cylinder and, and you have other things as well. Uh, right. Yeah, the cone will be, uh, will be uh, a new challenge. Right. Another more geometric, so, so this is geometric enough in the sense it says scalar determines how the, uh, and that was the title of, the, of, the, for, uh, the, uh, of this lecture, that scalar de determines how the curvature behaves or how the manifold behaves. But another way to say this, also very geometrical, and it follows from this estimate, is that either 
the so-called asymptotic volume ratio is positive. So this means the limit as r goes to infinity of volume of r over r to the fourth. Uh, this exists, this limit, and in, for shrinkers, and either it's positive or the manifold is asymptotically cylindrical. So, so either it's a cylinder asymptotically or it has maximal volume growth. That's an, another geometric way of, of stating this theorem. Okay? So, uh, of course, I, we don't really know now if this implies conical. The same way we don't really know if there's anything in between those two. Right? So there's a little bit of uh, difference. So, can f go to, go to zero along a sequence only? We don't know. It's possible. So, so maybe there's a third part here. Uh, but, but right now we only have this, and right now we only have this. We don't know if this implies conical. We suspect it does, but it remains to be seen. Okay. So I'll finish this today, and thank you for your attention.